Hello, this is Sonji A with The Globalists. It is said that literature defines us, whether it be Charles Dickens as a Brit or Ernest Hemingway as an American. But the real power of literature is that despite such differences, it also unites us, allows us to empathize with each other's joys and sorrows. On this episode of The Globalist, we have such a writer, a storyteller that has told the story of Korea and Koreans to the world. Welcome to the show, Min Jin Lee. Uh, your books, the acclaimed Free Food for Millionaires and now the global seller Pachinko, they've just caught the imagination of the global audience. What do you think about these stories have, has, has captured um, the audiences so? I think that most people around the world know very little about Korean people. And whatever they do know about Korean people, very often it's based on stereotypes which are really old fashioned mm. and also very wrong. It's not even a true stereotype. And then when they read these stories and they realize that Korean people have this ancient history mm. and they have had even very modern suffering, they're very surprised and they become more engaged. So I'm really delighted that they're engaged with the stories, but the popularity of it, it's really difficult to explain, except for the fact that the world right now is experiencing a wave of Hallyu, mm. and I'm part of that. Mm. But you have, a, of course, a following in the global audience, but now in Korea as well. And, you know, I think you were quoted somewhere saying that your Korean audiences are some of your most critical. What has been the response? Well. I think the reason why I said that the Koreans can be the most critical is because perhaps I care about the Korean response more than everybody else's. So part of it is that I want the approval of the Korean audience and the Korean readers very much. And that took me a long time to get to the level of confidence in, to which I can say, I am writing about Koreans and I can deal with whatever the response is. And that took me a long time in terms of doing the homework that I needed to do. Mm. Do you feel sometimes it might have been easier if you were not of Korean descent? Well, recently, when I received the Manhe Prize, I was told by one of the nominators that they thought the reason why I was able to write Pachinko is because I wasn't Korean. If I was Korean, oh. which I thought was fascinating, okay. if I was Korean, I wouldn't have attempted such a large thing. And I think that's actually kind of makes sense to me. Huh. I didn't know how large this book was going to be. And I didn't know that it would take up most of my adult life in order to write the proper story, to get the story correct. Perhaps if I had already known how difficult it is, I wouldn't have even ventured down that path. Hmm. But now that you have, <laughs> <laughs> um, and you have very successfully, um, I would like to say, I mean, the trilogy, um, as they say, it's, it's the... Uh, it's, and I call it the Koreans. <laughs> oh, yes, the, the, the Koreans. Um, they deal with the Korean stories, but they have a, a greater relevance to people. You know, the whole diaspora experience, um, it's the marginal groups and how it's difficult for them to assimilate. Do you find that relevance in other people that coming up to you um, with stories about their experiences? Well, I have this very strange experience of having had these books be successful to a mainstream audience in the United States. So I would have people who are like a white Jewish man who's 75 mm. from upstate New York tell me, I'm Casey Hahn. And that was really quite stunning. So things like that would happen to me very often. People who are Hungarian, who people from Palestinian 
descent, or people from Lebanon saying, I really identify with Sanja's story. Mm. And what they're really saying is, I know what it's like to be hyper-visible for persecution mm. and to be invisible for credit. And that is the experience of being an outsider, is that when things are very bad, you get blamed very quickly. So you're hyper-visible. But then when things that you're doing well are going on, you're almost invisible and you don't get credit. Like the experience of Asian American women right now in, the, in America. So mm -hmm. even though they're very visible in, in being seen as successful, the reality is their experience, mm -hmm. it isn't true. And despite all of their education and efforts, there is discrimination going on against Asian Americans, male and female, in the management level, in the C-level uh, spaces. And I think people don't want to talk about that. And mm. I don't have a problem talking about that because as a writer, you're always sort of on the outside. You're allowed to make these kinds of comments. Mm. In that context, every one of your books has a thesis statement. Mm -hmm. And I love the one for Pachinko, and it starts with, history has failed us, but no matter. It almost brings back Scarlett O'Hara in, <laughs> in Gone with the Wind. I don't give which, a damn. Yeah, in mm -hmm. which I don't give a damn, when I'm not gonna worry about today, I'll worry about it tomorrow, mm -hmm. type of thing. What did you mean by this thesis statement? I think that as somebody who trained in history at university, I was really interested in how History does not reflect the actual stories of ordinary people. Ordinary people are always neglected in history books because we don't leave primary documents. And as a historian, I understand why they're not considered because if they don't have diaries or photographs, if there are no newspaper accounts of you, then you don't even exist. Mm -hmm. But if you think about it, that's absurd that most of the world actually they're undocumented. And then I really thought about how all of my interviews and all of my research indicates that it doesn't matter because pe ordinary people, their attitude is, I'm going to survive anyway. So I wanted my thesis statement to say, even the establishment, even for those of us who are not kings or princesses, for those of us, we have still had this really important life. And it doesn't matter if there's no document of it because our lives really matter. So that's what I really meant. Mm. So in some ways, their lives are much more real than yeah. what happens. Our lives, our your life, life and yes. my life, especially so, as women. Yes, ordinary women. Ordinary women. Um, what part of a life of a Korean did you feel you wanted to highlight that, that the world did not understand? I think the working lives of ordinary people are very important. And for Korean people, I was really focused on, there are all these historical events in which ordinary people have almost no control mm. because the status hierarchies of Korea are so rigid. And yet their lives are really interesting and meaningful. So I thought, well, I wanna highlight that of being Korean is what is your occupation? What is your actual role in the hierarchy of Korea? And what does that look like on a day-to-day -day basis? How did you survive? when there was an occupation, a colonization, and there are wars. When you had to live in a country that didn't want you, how did you live your life? And when I interviewed the people, they looked at me like, what's the big deal? I lived, <laughs> and this is what I did. And usually they talked about their work, they talked about their children, they talked about their marriages, and they were just like everybody else. They just had the in injection of a historical shock. Mm. And we talked about this earlier, but it's not a story that they like to tell because yes. they don't think it's that revolutionary. Exactly. Yeah. But it's almost as if they were told that their story is not revolutionary and therefore it isn't. So if someone says to you, you've had a remarkable life and they go and you, and you say, I did. <laughs> mm. It's because the world doesn't elevate their lives. And I was saying, no, tell me more about your remarkable life because to me it's remarkable. And then gradually they would almost flower. They would start telling me more and more about the interesting the things that they did. The harrowing adventures of coming down on a train or a bus or a boat or hiding or trying to like even buy something very simple like a safety pin or mm. shoe polish, like the inability to buy shoe polish during the war. Like you and I don't normally think about this because we can have shoe polish whenever we want to. Yeah. Are we even thinking about buying shoe polish? We're thinking we can get a new pair of shoes rather than polish your old shoes. So 
all those kinds of little details that make up an ordinary person's life, to me, I thought that was fascinating. Why? Oh, I guess because their struggle for shoe polish, their struggle for to get an extra piece of fish to give to their daughter. To me, that was really interesting. Because it's the kind of struggle that everyone does? It's, it's, it's a struggle that everyone does, and it's a struggle that I've had. I remember standing outside of stores thinking, oh, I wish I had the money to buy that. Mm -hmm. I wish I had the courage to walk into that store. And I think those kinds of experiences, I'm always so happy that somebody else had it too. So maybe what it comes down to is, I feel less lonely when I know that another person has felt this way. And just learning that they had the ordinary struggles that my mother might have had and I've had, makes me feel comforted. Connected? Yes, yes, connected. Yeah. I'm sure that's what your readers feel too. I hope so. Yeah. <laughs>
For a woman, the man you marry will determine the quality of your life completely. A good man is a decent life, and a bad man is a cursed life. But no matter what, always expect suffering and just keep working hard. No one will take care of a poor woman, just ourselves. I know you talked about suffering, but that last part mm -hmm. hit home. Yeah, yeah. Because poor women, nobody takes care of them except other poor women. Yeah. And it is a refrain I heard over and over again, and it moved me. Because it's true, it's true. If you talk to oppressed minority women, they all say the same thing. My sisters came in through for me, and it wasn't like sisters, literally biological sisters. It's other women at their churches, it's other women in their neighborhood, the other school moms that they know. They're the ones who came through when they were sick, for example, or where they lost all their money. Um, and it's so important to understand the, the power of sisterhood, mm. especially for oppressed minorities. Yeah. Sisterhood, but ultimately, it's me. Mm. You know, it, it's it, there's. I feel it's like a there's a little bit of loneliness. Oh, very there. much. Yeah, very much so. I hear you're a meticulous research. I think it's that lawyer background. <laughs> <laughs> it's my nerd. It's, yeah. It's my inner nerd. Yeah, yes. Inner nerd. And it took you like 10 years to finish Pachinko. What was that process like? If you really want to understand why I'm a meticulous researcher, it's not just because I'm a nerd, but I think it's because I'm really insecure. Like, I think if I was a very confident person, I would just sort of sit down and say, this is a story. Accept it. I don't feel that way ever. <laughs> I feel like this is the story and accept it only after I did all the research and I could defend it. I could defend every line of Pachinko. If mm -hmm. you said to me, where does this come from? I could point to you the interview. I could tell you the circumstance, the image, the story behind every single sentence, every single line. I have to feel that strongly about something before I send it out. Recently, I was asked to introduce The Great Gatsby for Penguin Classics. And I, I thought, you know, I've been asked several times to do introductions for books, and I almost say no every time because I just think it's going to take such a long time. So I thought, okay, I'll take one month off and I'll write the introduction for The Great Gatsby. It took me three months. I ended up spending more money than I was paid for all the books that I bought just to research Fitzgerald's life. Mm. I ended up writing an introductory essay, and it had almost 100 footnotes. And but by the time I finished it, I felt like, oh, I have spoken on The Great Gatsby and it stands. <laughs> mm. And I felt really strong about what I said. And I thought, very importantly, I wanted the world to know a Korean American woman writer has spoken on The Great Gatsby. The Great American Novel. Oh, the Great American Novel, the so-called Great American Novel. And I'm proud to say that I spoke on it. If I'm an unconsciously deputized person for my community, then my insecurities are fairly well reasoned. I feel like I should do well because if I don't do well, it does reflect on others. On that point, <laughs> your next novel, American Hagwan. Mm -hmm. Oh, I like that name. Oh, thank you. Um, my publishers are quite pleased with it too. <laughs> yes. I mean, that's definitely on the education. Where are you going with this book? Well, with American Hogwarts in particular, the historical event that I was interested in as a backdrop, as a pivotal point, is the Asian financial crisis. Mm. If you ask any Korean person living today, what was a big moment for you? They would, they would not say it's the Korean War. They would actually say the Asian financial crisis. They call it the IMF crisis. Right, the IMF crisis. And when they talk about the IMF crisis, there wasn't a single Korean person who wasn't affected in some way and there was a greater generational and a class divide that occurred. Mm. So I'm interested in class and generational conflict. And very often you have class divisions within generations, right? Mm -hmm. When I meet young people at universities, I'm a pro college professor, 
And if they're a Korean person from Australia, a Korean kid from Canada, a Korean kid from Brazil, whatever, their parents could be lawyers, doctors, diplomats. And they're having a crisis of, I want to be a great something, poet, skier, you know, surfboarder, whatever. And then their parents are thinking, no, I still care about esteem. When I see young people trying to figure out how to be my best self, and all these other voices are just saying, you got to earn a good salary, <laughs> you got to get married, you have to be respected. They don't get a chance to actually develop. They don't even give themselves a shot. And it causes a great collapse mentally for young people when they have other people not believing in them. And it's a really serious problem. And because it's such a serious problem, I talk about it because I really hope that parents and grandparents and communities around all these young people can say, tell me, what do you want to do? And how, how do you want to do it? How can I help you? But the hagwon is where it all culminates? Yeah, yeah. Well, the hagwon, it's funny because if you say the word hagwon to a Korean person, they go, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I The parents will say, oh, it's so stupid, it, you know, it's expensive. And then the kids are like, oh, you know, it depends. A hagwon is just any place where people learn things. Mm. It's not a bad thing. I think what causes hagwons to be despised by some people is the cost very often and mm. also the unfairness that I could have access to hagwons but then you don't yeah right then it causes all this inequity so I understand that too however first things that I learned is one it could provide a child care function for working women the other thing that I learned about hagwons was that there's so many different kinds there are so many different kinds of Hagwan stories that after a while I realized all the stereotypes, again, were not true. That sometimes there are very necessary parts of society and other parts were that if these women didn't have any source of government support to take care of their families and if their colleagues weren't going to help them, if they couldn't find childcare and this woman went to college and actually had something to teach, then it was actually perfectly reasonable for her to be a Hagwan owner. It's such a true reflection of Hagwon. I've never heard this before. <laughs> and so I'm thinking to myself, you're going to get a lot of differing opinions about mm. American Hagwon. Yes. You're prepared for that, right? I think I'm prepared for it. And you know what? I'm going to say something really strange. I operate my research out of a deep love of Koreans. And it's the love that Koreans deserve. And I think I really want to be sympathetic rather than starting out with a bias against Koreans. So I think that if I'm in a position in which I could really love somebody, and not love like in a propaganda kind of way, because that's stupid, but to try to understand like, where are you coming from? And how do I love you? In a, in, talk about a strange thing to talk about, but it has to be an attitude of love. And then people will tell you the truth because they, ha they can't feel judged. And when I interview people, and go to hagwons, I'm not judging their life choices. Like, if you are a great hagwon owner, to me, that is a great achievement. Because that means that you've helped kids. Mm -hmm. I can't think of anything more noble than helping children. But I think a lot of people who are hagwon owners feel very judged. And I think that's a lot of hypocrisy. You can't use a system and then say terrible things about them afterwards. And because I'm not a hagwon user, because I'm just a writer, I want to approach it with a kind of fairness, but underneath the fairness, it's really love. I know that's weird. Not as weird as you would think. <laughs> I think that's a great note to end our interview today. Oh, thank you. Um, I had a great time talking with you. Oh, you're awesome, Ji. And I thank you um, for really taking the Korean story to the world. And because you do it with love, I think it resonates. Oh, thank you. Um, so thank you for talking to us today. <laughs> and I wish you great success. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. So thank you very much for joining us today. And that's it for me with The Globalist.